I tell you, I, for one, am thankful he's overcome. Man, I was just thinking this morning how awesome it is that God would see me at my worst, yet love me enough to send his best to give me a way to be with him forever. Just that right there is mind-blowing to me. I just, sometimes there's, you can get all about, thank you, you can get all about the complicated stuff in God, but sometimes it just boils down to, wow. You saw me, saw some value in me. That's pretty awesome. I don't know. I don't know about you, but I was pretty rough around the edges 10 minutes ago. <laughs> it ain't like we all get right right away, is it? Well, I want to welcome you. Uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Ken. I'm the senior pastor here at the Lord's Table. Uh, uh, hopefully you are uh, ready and engaged and you uh, have been here the last few weeks because we're in week three of our series about conflicts. And uh, just to bring you up to speed, uh, not give you too many of the details, but in the first week, uh, I gave a definition of conflict. It was just out of a textbook by these guys named Wilmot and Hawker. And they said this, they said that conflict is an expressed struggle between at least two interdependent parties who perceive incompatible goals, scarce resources, and interference from others in achieving their goals. And that's not spiritual at all. That's, this is actually a college textbook about uh, conflict management and whatnot. And we expanded on that and basically decided during the first week that we have to make a choice. We have to make a choice about, are we going to do conflict the way that the world does conflict, and I mean in a sense of, of meaning I win, you lose, uh, that type of stuff. And they even have some other ones where they, they say we both win. But at the end of the day, the difference between the way the world does conflict and the way everybody else does conflict is, is at the end of the day, in God, if I have a conflict with someone, the end, the end goal is restoration. It's not winning. And so, so it requires us to take a little bit of a different position uh, than, than otherwise. And then last week, Pastor Nick uh, did a great job. Uh, I listened to him uh, while I was in the gym doing some, doing some, I like to go to the gym and watch other people work out and it makes me feel better about myself, you know, I just kind of wander around and scratch stuff. And so, uh, so I was listening to, to Pastor Nick preach and he, t he, he hit on, on the scripture, Proverbs 19.11, where it says, sensible people control their temper, then they earn respect by overlooking wrongs. Pastor Nick talked last week about four questions that people can ask themselves to see whether is this even worth fighting about. You know, we can pick up all kinds of small offenses and, you know, I, I don't like saying these things. Like we always say, well, this is the worst times that there have ever, ever been. This is the worst and blah, blah, blah. But I don't know if we're in the worst spot as far as being offended. We're pretty easily offended people. Yet the scripture tells us as believers that there are some things we just have to overlook. Don't get bogged down in those little conflicts. And so Pastor Nick helped us out last week by giving us four questions. This week, I want to take both of those and I want to walk you through a biblical account of some people that had some conflict. And I wanna point out a pattern about conflict that you and I can find ourselves in and hopefully give you some answers as to, okay, if I'm here, then I can look forward to being there or I can maybe change the way I'm dealing with things because at the end of the day, we're not built to just be in conflict all the time. You know I mean? If, if, you, if, if you hear what I'm saying, you shouldn't always be on the defense. You shouldn't always feel bound up. You shouldn't always feel like every time you walk into a room that, that, that this is, you know, you got to put your armor on every single day against other people, right? Spiritually, we do. We gird up because we're in conflict with spiritual things. But that, that battle's not ours, right? But we change that, and we, we don't battle in the spiritual. We don't do spiritual warfare. We do physical warfare. And we have to make sure that we're in our right minds as believers and say, we're going after this thing, right? So, uh, so if you would pray with me, I have a ton of scripture. I won't apologize. It's an awesome account, uh, and we'll learn a lot from it. Amen. Lord, I thank you for being with us today. God, your presence and worship is always, always, always so life-giving. Lord, I just thank you that, that you chose, God, to inhabit this place with us today. Lord, I pray that you would be the teacher and guide of everything through your Holy Spirit this morning. God, help us to see something in here that helps us to live a way that reflects you to a world around us. We just ask you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right, I want to walk you through, uh, and if you don't mind, if you have your Bible, you can turn with me to um, Genesis chapter 26. We're actually going to go through most of the chapter. This first part, though, is the setup, and I'll kind of give a little bit of background where I need to. But let's start reading in verse 1. A severe famine now struck the land, and had a, as had a, happened, wow, I better start over. A severe famine now struck the land, as had happened before in Abraham's time, Abraham's time. So Isaac moved to Gerar, where Abimelech, king of the Philistines, lived. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt, but do as I tell you. Live here as a foreigner in this land. Remember foreigner. And I will be with you and bless you. I hereby confirm that I will give all these lands to you and your descendants, just as I solemnly promised Abraham, your father. I will cause your descendants to become as numerous as the stars of the sky, and I will give them all these lands. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be, will be blessed. Now, if you recognize that, that's the promise he gave to Isaac's father, <clears throat> um, Abraham. Okay. I will do this because Abraham listened to me and obeyed all my requirements, commands, decrees, and instructions. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. When the men who, who lived there asked, oh, they, he lived, stayed in Gerar. When the men who lived there asked Isaac about his wife, Rebekah, he said, she's my sister. Wow. Now just take a pause there because this will matter a little bit later. This is the very same sort of pattern that Abraham Abraham's wife, Sarah, was fine. Can you say that in church? Is that all right? Yeah, y'all act like you didn't understand that. She was a most lovely woman, <laughs> pleasing to the eye. Fine. And so they said, who's that? He was afraid that they'd kill him and take her. So Abraham said, she's my sister. This is the same Abimelech. Remember, that dealt with Abraham. And here's Abraham's son coming through, and his wife is fine. Here we go again. Hey, who's that? That's my sister. Oh, boy. He was afraid to say she's my wife. He thought they, they would kill me uh, together because she's so beautiful. Okay? Sometime later, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out his window and saw Isaac caressing Rebekah. Yikes. Immediately, Abimelech called for Isaac. Now listen, picture this now. Immediately. Because this is actually where the conflict starts. We think it's later, but this is where it starts, and I'll tell you why. Abimelech called for Isaac and exclaimed. Sometimes we get lost in the language. This is, this is Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, sees him caressing his sister, and he calls for him, and he exclaims yells, she is obviously your wife. Why did you say she's my sister? Because I was afraid someone would kill me to get her from me, Isaac replied. How could you do this to us? Abimelech exclaimed, yelling again. One of my people might easily have taken your wife and slept with her, and you would have made us guilty of great sin. Then Abimelech issued a public proclamation. Anyone who touches this man or his wife will be put to death. Now, why in the world would a, would a Philistine king go like, because the Philistines, they're supposed to be bad people, right? All of a sudden, he has a clarity about adultery and taking another woman's wife. Why? Because the deal was, when he dealt with Isaac's father, Abraham, guess who visited Abimelech in a dream, a very vivid dream? The Lord. God, not even an angel, God came to him, and he warned him. He said, that woman that you got, you better not touch her. He's a prophet, and that's his wife. And it said that Abimelech got up early in the morning and made it right. So Abimelech is probably thinking, what is wrong with you people? I don't know what Abraham and Isaac's last name was, but he probably called it you Joneses. Seem to bring your fine wives into my city and then say they're your sister and you keep getting us 
very close to destruction with this God of yours, right? So he knew that Isaac was Abraham's son. He knew that God was on their side. But yet, can you imagine the offense that Isaac did by saying she's my sister and getting him that close again to being in that spot because God said, listen, if any of y'all touch her, you're all going to die. So Abimelech knows God. He knows the standard. And he's exclaiming at Isaac about this. And so you can see where, listen, a lot of times when we get into a big conflict about this over here, but sometimes there's something over here that starts that whole mess. Can you imagine how Abimelech felt about Isaac after this? Because they kind of had an agreement. They had an understanding. Yet here Isaac goes, and in Abimelech's mind, puts him at a huge risk of offending this God that visited him in, in a dream so many years before. Pulling this, the same mess as Abraham. All right? Anyone who touches this man or his wife will be put to death. So here we are. Isaac, his people, his, his servants, his cattle, everything. They're, they're good. They're with us and all that. So don't touch them. Here we go. Verse 12. When Isaac planted his crops that year, he harvested a hundred times more grain than he planted. That's a lot, by the way. For the Lord blessed him. He became a very rich man and his wealth continued to grow. He acquired so many flocks of sheep and goats, herds and cattle and servants that the Philistines became jealous of him. Write down jealousy because this is number one where you see where the offense began, but then now you see where jealousy creeps in. And I want you and I to be honest with ourselves when we look at our conflicts and see where does this jealousy lie? Where does it lie? You see, I want you to understand that jealousy is one of the first steps in this this process of conflict and understand now God works through processes listen to me God works in processes and a lot of times I myself have basically asked God to not be himself in my prayers and here's why I ask him to circumvent the process and so what I'm asking God to do a lot of times is hey don't don't go with me through it. I just want you to get me over here to the other side. But it's in going through the thing that something gets built in you and I. And I want you to see where Isaac goes through a process here. And you see where Isaac learns something all along the way. See, God could have said, all right, Abimelech's giving you hassle and his guys are giving you hassle. I shall smite them. Right? Well, he didn't. They just became jealous of him. And so jealousy creeps in. We talk about jealousy real quick because you have to understand this. We read the definition, if you remember, uh, just a second ago about, about conflict, and I want to point that out. I'll grab this real quick, go back. Because one of the definitions was that the two parties are interdependent, so they have to deal with one another. And then one of the things that they perceive is incompatible goals, scarce resources, or interference. See, the problem with Abimelech's men who became jealous of Isaac is that they do not know God. We have to understand that when we get jealous of scarce resources, that we're not thinking about God. My God's limitless in his ability to provide resources. You see, the problem is, is that sometimes we think that, uh, well, you are getting too much, which means I won't get enough. And the reality is that that's not true in God. God can provide every resource. He can provide abundance to an abundance to an abundance over the course of whatever. He can provide everything that we need. So if you think that uh, if, if, if for me, if I'm jealous of someone because I think they don't have enough love to give to this and to me, I get jealous. Amen? When we think scarcely, we're not thinking like God. And they saw that he was being um, blessed, as the scripture said, and that he's getting a return on his investment, so to speak, of a hundred times. He gets rich and he gets resources 
And all of a sudden, they become jealous because they don't understand that there's enough in God to provide all the way across the board. They could be living the same way. Verse 15 says, So the Philistines filled up all of Isaac's wells with dirt. These were the wells that had been dug by the servants of his father Abraham. Finally, Abimelech ordered Isaac to leave the country. Go somewhere else, he said, for you have become too powerful for us. This is where the next step, strife, creeps in. Strife, a friction, this rubbing. Have y'all ever noticed when you get aggravated with something, it just, you can't let it go. You see everything through the lens of that one thing. Y'all ever had somebody get on your last nerve? I'm talking about your last one. Like the, the one that just sticks out there that is real close to your brain and pain don't have to travel real far, right? Do you know that it doesn't matter what they do, good, bad, or ugly, they're going to aggravate you. They, if, if someone's on that side of you, they could bring you your favorite meal. And you'd go, why are you bringing me that? Right? Why are you doing that? Why didn't you bring me the other? Or it's too little too late, baby. Should have brought that yesterday, you know. And so it doesn't matter. You think about this. When we get this way, when, when there is strife has crept in, now, now understand that strife is like discord. It's like it's heavy conflict. It's like when we are just rubbing one another. It's a... It's a it's a scratchy shirt on a sunburnt neck. That's what it is, okay? It just, you can't see past it. You can't get beyond it. It's, ugh, right? Strife. And strife does this. It says, go somewhere else. In other words, he said, hey, come on in, Isaac. You can come. Oh, better yet, you, nobody better touch this man or his wife. Now, all of a sudden, after one harvest season, we've got, you need to get out of here. Get out of my yard, right? No more. No more hang you hanging out in country. You become too powerful for us. And I want you to notice that because it just shows that when there's discord, when there's strife, there's, logic doesn't matter. The king of the Philistines just told Isaac, living in the land, remember, as a foreigner, that you've become too powerful for us. Isaac didn't have an army. He had sheep and cattle and servants. The Philistines had an army, but yet the king looks at him and he goes, you got to get out of here because you become too powerful for us. There's no logic in that. That is just strife. That is just that thing. And you know what? We're going to have that. And it's important for you and I to recognize when that happens. Because when someone feels that way, the next thing begins to happen. So Isaac moved away, didn't fight with him. Remember, the Lord told him to live in the land as a foreigner. He told him that one day your ancestors are going to own all this. But Isaac did not live there as an owner. He didn't have an owner mindset. He heard what the Lord said, and he's living there as a foreigner. So when the king says move, he moves. Isaac moved away to the Gerar Valley, where he set up their tents and settled down. He reopened the wells his father had dug, which the Philistines had filled in after Abraham's death. Isaac restored the names Abraham had given them. They loved to name wells. Isaac's servants also dug in the Gerar Valley and discovered a well of fresh water. But then the shepherds from Gerar came in and claimed the spring. This is our water, they said, and they argued over it with Isaac's herdsmen. So Isaac named the well Essek, which means argument. Isaac's men... Then dug another well, which, again, there was a dispute over it. So Isaac named it Sitna, which means hostility. And so you can see where we go from them being jealous of him to then they're being striped, and now they're pursuing him. Now everything you do, we're going we're gonna to mess it up. We're coming after you. And there's, now we've gone from just having hostility and strife now, or, or, or just strife, you know, arguments. Now we've gone on to hostility. Now we're being, we're being, you're being uh, pursued by an aggressive type of thing. Any, everybody, anybody ever been there? 
This is our water, they said. Now remember, water always represented life and grace, all these things, provision. And they came in, they said, no, that is our water that you found. Now, if, if this was Ken and not Isaac, at this point, the story would not go this way. But it's Isaac, not Ken. And so it says in verse 22, abandoning that one. Do you see what Isaac's doing? How does he, how many cheeks does this man have? Abandoning that one, Isaac moved on and dug another well. And this time, there was no dispute over it. So Isaac named the place Rehoboth, which means open space. For he said, at last, the Lord has created enough space for us to prosper in this land. Now, I want you to see the pattern here. The pattern that, that, that this follows is, is there's jealousy, then there's strife, and then there's this just outward argument type conflict, hostility. And Isaac moves again. Isaac abandons that one and he moves. And so one of the lessons for you and I is that we have to be very keen on where we are and aware of what our place is. He knew his place in this land was one of a foreigner. The Lord told him that. And so he doesn't have permission from God to go after the king. It wouldn't work out well anyway. Remember, it doesn't say anything about he amassed an army. He was a, a farmer. And so he left the well. He left another well. Now he leaves another well. And in this pattern, you see that it says that he reaches a place where there's no more dispute over it. And he calls it open space. And he says, at last, the Lord's created enough space for us to prosper in this land. The Lord's created enough space. One of the biggest things that we need to understand is that, that in every conflict, before the resolution, there's a space. There's a, there's a, whew, right? Can you imagine when they dug the well? After this pattern, how they stood around and waited, I know they're coming again. Where are they at? Sitting there looking. And they were probably thinking, not Isaac, but his servants were probably thinking, we've had enough of this whole abandoning the well thing. I imagine there was murmuring. Oh, Isaac keeps wanting to leave the wells, but he ain't the one digging the wells. We're the ones digging the wells. He always wants to leave the wells. I ain't digging no more wells. And you know, you know the people are people, right? But all of a sudden, after so much time, there's open space created. And it's a space where it says, at last the Lord has created enough space for us to prosper. Here's one big point for you and I. We cannot prosper in conflict. Conflict sucks away energy from your purpose. And I'm just going to say this, and I'm, I know it's none of y'all, but I know people in life that they absolutely feast. And when I say feast, they gorge themselves, love themselves, seek after what I call drama, but is actually conflict. If they don't have one of their own, they'll get in yours. If they don't have one of yours, they'll jump on somebody else's. And they feast on it, and they love it. And, it and, and here's the problem. It becomes so addicting to be involved in that that you will live your life and never realize your true purpose, true peace, true joy, because you will have spent your life in a conflict state that you can't grow in. You never got to the open space where it says we can prosper. You can't prosper. I know everybody doesn't agree and they think, hey, drama's fun. Drama's good to get involved in. It's good, but it will lead you into a place of poverty. And I'm not talking about financial poverty. It might, but it's going to lead you to a place of spiritual poverty 
when you always latch on to an offense, when you always grab on to the next fight, when you always reach into somebody's drama or create your own, when you get good at this, you can make drama out of nothing. You could just, you just see it everywhere. Someone can say to you, I like your hair. Oh, do you? Right? Everything becomes drama. And the reason I bring that up is because you, I don't want you to live there. Because I need you and you need me to prosper. We need to be living in the place of prosperity in our lives where we can bless one another. If, if, if Isaac had locked in three wells ago into a conflict with with Abimelech's men where his men dug the well, the other ones filled it in. His men dug the well, the other ones filled it in. Guess what would have happened all the while? The cattle would have starved. The sheep would have dehydrated. The crops would have had no water. And while they were in conflict, everything that represents prosperity in their life would have dried up, died, and went away. And they would have looked around and said, what happened? It's his fault, right? Here we go again. But Isaac was willing, if you want to say so, to turn the cheek and the other cheek and the other cheek because he knew what? That God was with him. Remember, we said in the beginning where the Lord went to him and he told him very clearly, I'll back up. You don't have to go there with me, but I'll back up and hear what, hear what the Lord said to him. He said, listen, he appeared to Isaac and said, don't go to Egypt, but do as I tell you. He said, I'm going to give you all these lands, everything. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to fulfill all the promises I made to Abraham and all this stuff. But I want you to understand that I will cause all these descendants to, to, to come from you. This is going to be their land. But right now, live as a foreigner in this land, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. And so sometimes we need to understand in the middle of our conflict, one of the one things we can have, if it's the only thing, it's the big enough thing, is that the Lord is with me. If I'm in a conflict that I don't see any way out of, if I'm in a conflict that is heavy on me, if I don't see, you know what? At the end of the day, I need to know the Lord is with me. And I know he'll bless me. I know he'll bless me. And if I follow along with these things and I don't get caught up in jealousy and I don't get ensnared by strife and I don't get hung, uh, hung by my neck by arguments and hostility and I get to this place, Rehoboth, open space where the Lord can prosper me, then then I can begin to get my head around what, what's about this conflict. Some of y'all have long time conflicts. I do in my life. And, and me and another guy were talking this week. And this next principle, I want you to latch on to it. Please, if you get one thing out of this whole series, get what I'm about to say now. Okay? Get it, get it, get it, and grab onto it. It starts out in verse 23. It says, From there Isaac moved to Beersheba, where the Lord appeared to him on the night of his arrival. Now listen, this is, this is uh, Isaac who he's found his space and he moves on. There's, there's not a lot of conflict, but there's what? Unresolved conflict back here. He's been moved. He could be resentful about where he is. He could be mad that he's not over there. He could be mad that he's had to dig all these wells. He could make a case about what a horrible king Abimelech is. He could be bitter and he could be sour about the whole deal, sideways with everybody about all this that's gone on. But Isaac basically is in a position where it looks like he's just letting this conflict move him, knowing that God is with him wherever he goes. So conflict will move us. But watch what happens. He says, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you, and I will bless you. It's the second time he said that. I'll multiply your descendants, and they'll become a great nation. Again, the promise. I will do this because of my promise to Abraham, my servant. And then Isaac built an altar there and worshiped the Lord. He set up his camp at that place, and his servants dug another well. One day, King Abimelech came from Gerar with his advisor, Ahuzath, and also Phicol, his army commander. And Isaac says, why have you come here? You obviously hate me since you kicked me off your land. But I want you to notice where the Lord appeared to Isaac and told him this. I don't think 
that right as they finished digging another well, I don't think Abimelech showed up. I think sometimes we read stuff and we think, oh, well, you know, it's like this happened, this happened. I think there's a little bit of time and there's a little bit of space there. Because here's what happens when you and I are in conflict. When we get to our open space, you need to understand that God is with you. And if God is with you, and God doesn't want you to have resentment, strife, anger, bitterness, all those things, then you have to trust that in the middle of your conflict, God will move. God will move. So here's the deal. When I am in an argument, a conflict, when I'm in a place of strife and jealousy with someone else, my inclination, my personality is, is, is I want to get, I want to get aggressive, I want to get authoritative, and I want to get you to the table, because I don't like conflict. I want you here and now, and I want to settle it, right? And I've made this mistake. I've made the mistake of getting people to the table when they didn't want to be at the table, and we come to an agreement, and when they leave, it meant nothing, and I thought we were good. What we have to understand is, is that is in that open space, in the middle of this process, there's a space for God to work on your behalf to bring something to that conflict. I want to solve it. I am a fix-it guy. I've been a fix-it guy since I was a little kid. I like to take broken stuff and make it work. I like to take stuff that was messed up and people wanted to throw away, and I like to make, you know, make it do something, all that stuff. I became a mechanic. All that. I just want to fix, fix, fix. But the reality is, is that when it comes to things like this, there's, it's too complicated. And there's a fixer that fixes that I, stuff that I can't fix. And that is the Holy Spirit. And so understand that, that in the middle of my conflict with someone, the Holy Spirit has to have the open space for me to prosper and for this thing to be healed. There has to be the open space. And when we get our mouth in it and when we get our jabs in and when we do that it doesn't it closes that space down and we've shut down the exact spot that the Holy Spirit will begin to do something on your behalf and the other person's behalf so this open space is massive sometimes we just have to shut our mouth stop talking to the person get away and let the Holy Spirit do things on our behalf in that relationship that might be 10 minutes That might be 10 years. But here's my ad lib. I hate adding stuff to the Bible, so let me make my my disclaimer. This isn't in the Bible. What I'm about to say isn't in the Bible, but it is what I think, because I'm trying to think my way through this. Remember when I said one day King Abimelech came from Gerar, and he brought his advisor, uh, Suda, and his commander from the army? Why would they do that? Why would the king leave his land when he got what he wanted? Isaac was out of here. His guys didn't have to see them digging wells and water coming up every time they poked a hole in the ground. His guys didn't have to see him getting a hundredfold from every one of his investments. They didn't have to see his wealth being massed. There wasn't the jealousy, but why would he do it? Why? Because in that space, I believe that Abimelech, had to remember his dream with God and had to remember who Isaac was. And he remembered his father and he remembered him. And I think that the Lord had to get involved in it and make sure that Abimelech knew that he did not want to leave this on these terms with this guy. I want you to see what he says here. (laughs) Isaac said, you obviously hate me since you kicked me off your land. Notice that Abimelech didn't even deny that he hated him. Watch what he says. (laughs) He said, we can plainly see that the Lord is with you. So we want to enter into a sworn treaty with you. Let's make a covenant, Isaac. Swear that you will not harm us, just as we have never troubled you. We have always treated you well. And we sent you away from us in peace. And now look how the Lord has blessed you. All y'all just thought I would punch that man in the face for saying that to me. All these miles, all my guys mad at me for all those wells. God was blessing me in your backyard and you chased me out. 
That's not in there. He said, now look how the Lord has blessed you. So Isaac prepared a covenant feast to celebrate the treaty. And they ate and they drank together. Early the next morning, they took a solemn oath not to interfere with each other. And then Isaac sent them home again. And they left him in peace. Guys, something happened between verse 29 and verse 30. Where even in coming to Isaac, Abimelech is obviously not seeing this thing like Isaac. Isaac could have called a court and won it hands down that this man is crazy, but he didn't. He chose a better way. He didn't argue. He didn't revisit. He didn't condemn. He made a meal, a covenant feast. That's a good meal. It's not just any meal. It's a big meal to celebrate the treaty. And I ask myself, because sometimes I don't understand the Bible very much, why would Isaac do such a thing? Why? I mean, because me, I'm the justice guy. I'm the truth guy. That ain't true. That ain't right. He's making a treaty with a guy who's crazy, who sees it all wrong, and he needs to straighten him out. How can he go on knowing that Abimelech is misled? Doesn't he owe him to open his eyes and show him the truth? God, where are you in this? He's right there in verse 29.5 when he moves on Isaac, and Isaac says, it's okay. It's okay. Do you know why Isaac saw it was okay? Because he never forgot that God told him, all this is going to be yours anyway. You're fi why fight over what is ours? Knowing who we are and who God is gives us the ability to walk away from petty squabbles. Even if they don't seem so petty like this, they're petty. Because God had already solved this whole thing. So he says, okay, we'll have a treaty. They ate and they drank together. And then they got up early. They made an oath. And he sent them away. And they left him in peace. That very day, Isaac's servants came to him and told him about a new well they had dug. These guys love to dig some wells, man. They said, we found water. And so Isaac named the well Sheba, which means oath. And to this day, the town that grew up there is called Beersheba, which means the well of the oath. So you and I will see this process. We'll see jealousy. We'll see strife come. We'll see arguments and hostilities come. But if we will allow it, we'll find ourselves eventually in some open space. And instead of running back to the hostility, I want you to think from now on to run forward into the open space. Relax, let it be, let it ferment, and let your helper, the Holy Spirit, the greatest help that's ever been given to anybody, the Holy Spirit, because he can, he can transcend space, he can transcend time, he can transcend whatever he needs to transcend to accomplish the work that God wants done. Rest in the open space and know that God in the middle of your conflict will work. And then you have to do your work after he does his forgiveness. You might have somebody come to you and they might be just as crazy as Abimelech. I've always treated you so well. And you're like, are we on the same planet? You are crazy. But Isaac didn't say that. You notice what Isaac said? Nothing. He just made a meal. And he ate and drank with them. And he sent them away in peace, which is the last thing. You and I want some peace, right? Well, this is one of God's patterns how to get there. An offense gets jealousy. Jealousy starts some strife. Some strife will get you into some arguments. 
Those arguments, if you allow them, can either lock you into war or drive you into an open space. It's your choice. God can get in the middle of your conflict five minutes or five or 50 years, and the Holy Spirit will work in it. And then it's going to land back in our lap, and we're going to be faced with an idea of whether we still fight for what we think or if we allow forgiveness to come in right there in that instant. And out of forgiveness, peace. And out of peace, restoration, which is the end game for what God wants. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me? I mentioned at the beginning that it always amazed me that God would see me at my worst and he would send his best, his son Jesus, to save me. And and I began to think about that in terms of this. And I began to wonder, how do, did you end up being an atheist? How'd you do that? Well, it started with what I perceived as an offense. God didn't do what I asked him to do. And then I began to see God as greedy. And then I began to see that me and him weren't on the same page. And then that ultimately led to such a place where I just said, well, whatever God they're talking about, they're crazy because that's not the God I see. And I was twice as crazy as Abimelech. Because every now and then, the guy who said there is no God would still rail at that God. Because there was a conflict and it was when I stopped thinking about God at all and I was in an open space but it wasn't an open space of prosperity trust me but in that open space I can remember how the Holy Spirit began to to move in my life through people through my wife it's amazing and so when I say that God will work in these spaces where it doesn't seem like anything's happening, please trust me, he will. There are things that the Holy Spirit can mediate between you and another person that no one else can mediate. But think about it when we were far from God. All this offense, all this conflict, he sent his son. He sent that offering. He sent the thing that would give us a treaty. He would make an oath with us through his son, Jesus. He would say, listen, if you will believe in my son, Jesus, and you will put your faith and your trust and your hope in him, I will save you. I'll forgive you of all the sins that you've ever committed, and I'll restore you into a good relationship with me. That invitation was there and is here today. If you've never received Jesus as your savior, if you've never trusted him, to do for you with God what no other person, no, doesn't matter how great their skills are at speaking or arguing, the only one that can bring you to a place of trusting Jesus is the Holy Spirit. You might be here today, you might say, you know what, he's been talking to me, I know it. I don't know how I know it, but I know it. And it's my day, I wanna be saved. Now I want you to raise your hand up boldly. Just hold it up high where we can see it. Anybody wants to receive Jesus, just pray a prayer of forgiveness, anyone. No? You sure? All right. Us being the recipients of his promise, those of us who know him and trust him as Lord and Savior, we have a responsibility to do one thing, and I'm gonna back up and read you one scripture I already read to you. Abimelech came to Isaac in verse 28 of chapter 26 of Genesis. And his argument wasn't anything about what had happened. His argument was this, we can plainly see that the Lord is with you. We can plainly see that the Lord is with you. How did they see it? Because Isaac was doing it God's way. It's on us, guys, to do it God's way. It's on us to get to a place when we handle conflict the right way. You don't have to go and solve it. It'll come and solve it to you. It'll bring it. It'll come right back to you. And they'll say, I just don't know. They might not say it this way, 
we can plainly see that the Lord is with you. But what they'll see is that there's something different about you and me. We deal with things a little different than the next guy who's just going to fight and squabble. Amen? God's calling us to a greater approach in our conflicts in life. Amen? You guys are the ones who people look at and say, we can see that the Lord is with you. Amen? Father, I pray, God, that you would bless your people. Lord, that they would walk in open spaces, places of prosperity, God, and peace that they've never known before. Lord, I pray that you would set this word in our hearts, God, and bring it to our remembrance in the heat of the matter, God, so that we might live like you want us to live. God, I pray that you would bless them, God, in every way, God, that you would bring your word to bear in every one of their circumstances. God, meet needs that only they know about, the matters deep in their heart, God, I pray that you'll move in them. Lord, I pray that each and every one will see you, God, as our source that is unlimited, God. Don't ever let us get jealous. You are our provider, and there's more than enough in you of everything we could ever ask or hope for. We claim that in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray a blessing over each one as they go. Amen, amen, amen. Love you guys. Thank you for being here.